Okay, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here again. I was here last year. It's always wonderful to hear at AFNA. Speakers this morning, fantastic, how invigorating. So hopefully this little part here is a bit of a twist on all what we've been speaking about. Um, I'm actually that woman there, Diana Fornasia. I'm a credentialed diabetes educator. I work full-time employed in general practice. We're a four-practice consortium, 25,000 patients, um, how many doctors? 16 doctors, 14 full-time nurses with roles and hats of CDMs in that, a nurse practitioner in her final training. Um, we're actually hiring a second credentialed diabetes educator July 1st. We've got a podiatrist. Um, we're spread out across four different sites. I go to each of those sites. So I'm very lucky. Um, I'm also a chief investigator at the University of Wollongong and on the research team for the Illawarra. Um, I'm very fortunate to be a subcommittee member of Kidney Australia and that just happened from the APNA conference a couple of years ago which is very interesting. So APNA is a place of the you know, sh movers and shakers. Um, it's a privilege to be here and I'm sponsored actually by my work and also by Kidney Australia. And what I'm going to speak on hopefully is relevant to everybody in the room. I think it will be, so let's move on. I'm going to do this a little bit differently. It's going to be a bit interesting for you all. Let's see how this goes. Okay, do you know what a seahorse looks like? Yeah? You think so? All right, close your eyes. Open your eyes. Did it look like that? Did it look like that? Okay. Did it look like that? Ooh. Did it look like that? Did it look like that? So, we came with the idea of what a seahorse looks like, yet we've seen seahorses up there, haven't we? Can you identify all those seahorses if I didn't have the labels on them? Would you know one's a weedy and one's a leafy? No. Well, that's what today's about. Not the seahorses, though. Kidneys. Do you know what a kidney looks like? You think now? Oh, oh this could be a trick question. <laughs> she showed all those funny animals. Looks like that, yeah? All right. Can you classify kidney disease? Female, ACR, 36. Boy, this is annoying. I like to run around. I need a mic that I can roam. Okay, ACR is 36. EGFR, 45. What do we have here? Anyone going to stab at it? Two. Mm. Ooh, boy. Okay, so if you look at this, and we go back to here, 45. I tricked you, see? 3A. Right, 45 to 59 EGFR, and an ACR, ooh, pretty shabby ACR. Where is she on the ACR? Let's go back. 36, macroalbinuria, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Is this all very foreign to you? Yeah. No? Who says no? Okay. All right. So that's what we're talking about today. Could I have one of those? No problem. Okay. Can you hear me okay? No. Oh, let's go back over here. Right. Okay. So time is of essence, so I'm going to try and keep my head looking at this microphone and looking at the screen and looking at you all at the same time. Well, we talked about the seahorses and the kidney does generally look like that. But in our organisation at Shellhaven Family Medical Centres, we wanted to light a match on this business because we're a bit concerned. God. We're a bit concerned about the kidneys. And we realised there was a lot of people out there that had them, and we weren't really looking at them very seriously, but we had a lot of things on our best practice that said renal impairment. Well, I'm a credentialed diabetes educator, and one third of diabetics are going to have renal impairment, and we have a lot of diabetics. We have 1,400 diabetics, 300 on insulin. So I got a bit concerned that we weren't classifying them, but we were a bit foggy on what we had to do. So we said, I'm really having trouble with this mic here, Ramming mic should be on now. Oh, yes. Oh. Very unusual. Okay, how are we now? Are we talking? No. Jeepers. Sorry, guys. How about this one? Woohoo! All right, 
So, I don't have a pocket, so we'll just have to shove it up here somewhere. Off we go. So, in Australia, there's about um, all this group here that we're concerned about. We think they're at risk. Do you have any of those patients in your practice? Um, and how many of those patients do you think are in your practice? A lot? Heaps? Quite a lot, isn't there? So, we decided that this is pretty important work, that we should take a better look at this kidney function. And we, went, we weren't really sure how we're going to go about doing it. And when I joined the, the Kidney um, Australia Committee, I became really passionate because the guidelines were coming out and we had already started to focus on that. So we had an opportunity to use the, case, the chronic kidney disease guidelines and implement that in general practice because we had the document to support us and guide us through. Well, that was beautiful, but it was a long journey and that's the little journey you're going to hear about a bit today. So implementing some education because the seahorses were a bit wobbly. We weren't quite sure about these seahorses, so we had to clear up the seahorses. We had to look in the weeds to find these seahorses, but we really need to know what we're looking for. And so there was a big rollout of education. The nurses were quite inspired to do this. The GPs thought they knew it. They thought they knew what seahorses looked like. But in the end, our vision became a little bit clearer as we started to put some signposts up of where we were going with what. We got very, very um, industrious and we proclaimed that all our patients are going to have their kidney function looked at just like a vital sign. Yay! That was a massive step because every nurse that opened up a file had to look at the EGFR and the ACR and she had to classify it for practice. And she had to download on her desktop the chronic kidney disease booklet. Who's done that? Who has that on their desktop? Promise me today when you leave this lecture, that's one thing you do and you'll, I'll see, you'll see why in a moment. So we did all these things. We made sure that if they had a problem that was entered on their active problem list, we came up with the action plan following the um, chronic kidney disease pathway. We made sure that if they had the EGFR that was impaired or the ACL was high, that we followed the guidelines in order to screen that and to work it up to identify what they were. Were they truly seahorses? Were they weedies? Were they leafies? Um, we started to look at our referral system and how we refer on to these patients to the nephrology groups. That was another beautiful partnership built. We started to set up um, standing order for pathology for the nurses to do and we had to work out a system for reviews. And we had to make sure we were doing the cardio risk factor as well. Now that sounds like a little list. Well that list turned into a bigger list. <laughs> and the breaking news was we were really struggling because we found out that our processes were impaired, our pathway, we had a straight line, but it was really difficult. We had a lot of bridges to build. We had checklists to make. We didn't have people really to refer to. It seemed like there was an empty end when we faxed things off. We never ever got those patients booked in for some reason. So we had to build some partnerships with the local renal teams. The nurses had to um, get their heads around the documentation component and to really digest and walk the talk of the education. So more lists began. We did staff education, we sorted out the documentation, we put referral processes in place and we refined those with the renal team. We are the only ones now in Australia with a renal partnership with the CNCs and the um, CNS um, and we're working every week it seems at the moment with um, setting up groups for patients to have kidney education within our practice. We've actually redesigned the referral process for them, for Wollongong and for the Shellhaven, um, and we're their guinea pig practice pilot um, practice site. Uh, we meet with the renal team, we meet with core GPs, we rolled out more education, we linked um, people to information, we do face-to-face -face education, we came up with new forms and templates and systems, and we started up some cheat sheets for nurses. Now, originally, one of the nurses said to me, Diana, that book, do I have to read the whole book? I said, you need to download it and you need to absolutely know how to go to page 17 and 18. And then, later, after you're quite proficient at doing that and you can stand there and say EGFR 45 and so-and-so, that's a so-and-so and that's a so-and-so, off by heart, then we'll have some cheat sheets. I didn't want to put the cheat sheets in front of the learning because it's so easy to just go to the cheat sheet. So... Care plan reviews, of course, were timely times to do the renal follow-up, so we tried to do that. We dovetailed chronic kidney disease stage four 
and at risk, and those really in stage five. Some of our people were in stage five. Um, they weren't regulars, but we picked them up and they were not in good shape. And some of them actually went off for dialysis within that month. Um, we decided that this is getting really complicated. We've got a lot of patients out there. It was 3B and 4. And so we started to assign nurses as the kidney nurse. So they took over those care plans and those care plan reviews for that group of population at risk because we didn't want them to fall through the cracks. And we wanted to be sure that when we referred them on that they did go to the referral. Um, and if they didn't get the referral, what happened? Where was the breakdown? These people can't be sitting out there with an EGFR of 24 and an ACR of 550 for eight months. It was pretty important stuff. I don't know who's in the room here. Is um, Roz in the room? No. Um, anyway, so the renal education continued on. Nurses needed to have more and more education. Doctors needed more education. We needed to really be sure that everyone was walking the same talk and we're all following strictly the guidelines. And when we got confused, we talked. They emailed me or best practiced me messages or they went to Kathy, our um, strategic manager. We decided that we need to spread the team load out, so we decided to um, find an interested nurse who was interested in renal, and one of our nurses picked up that flag and said, I'd like to do this dye. And so that was good, because I'm the diabetes educator. That's my focus. But in that, I'm also a transformational leader, and it was really beautiful to mentor her into taking on that as a new role for her. She's probably in the early 30s, new to general practice. It was beautiful to see her have a project to take a hold of. So. Everybody on their desktops at work have the chronic kidney disease guideline. It's a PDF, um, not a PDF, there's a link at the kidney site. Go online, it will say download. Download and stick it on your desktop and in the morning the girls come in and that's what they open up. That page sits on their desktop all the time because every patient's EGFR and ACR is looked at if it's done. And if it wasn't done, why wasn't it done? Are they part of the target group? Smoker? Mm-hmm. Right. So, Generally, the anatomy and the physiology, of course, we had to be sure that our nurses understood that and some nurses needed more brush up. We're very good about being kind and not um, embarrassing each other. So if I had a nurse um, who I felt was really struggling, um, I'd say, how are you doing with um, that implementation and picking up those skills? And she's like, oh, I died. It just drives me mad. I, I look at it and I get so confused. That chart confuses me. And I say, OK, so let's go back to the chart and I'd sit down with her when I was there for my diabetes work and go through and build her confidence up. And then at our nurses' meeting, we'll discuss cases, and then we start to profile the winners. There was lots of nurses going, oh, I found one with an EGFR of 22, and da-da-da-da, and we fast-tracked them, and they went here, and they went there. And there was this massive, yoo-hoo, kudos, and the team was flying, and everyone felt great. Everyone knew if there's an EGFR less than 60, you're onto it. That's why 60's on the corner there. We've got to sort them out. Are they really impaired? So let's screen them. Understanding the ACR took a lot, and people still a bit wobbly about it. Lots of questions came up. So Di, if their ACR is this, but their albumin is that, and that's that, is that that? So even though we did lots of education, we had lots of support for the last 12 months, we decided to bring the renal nurses in and do more education on that, and that was beautiful. So this page here appears in the booklet, and if a patient comes in with an EGFR, say, of... 54, and you've only had, ever seen one EGFR, so that's not really that good, um, and the ACR was never done, so you think, okay, let's check that out. We'll get the EGFR repeated with an ACR, and let's see what happens. So repeat EGFR within uh, 14 days, and we're right over here on the left-hand side coming down EGFR, and then it says, if greater than 20% loss, oh, that's a serious situation, um, and then if not, follow it down, repeat EGFR again within three months, and then make a decision what they are. So it's not just one EGFR that you're doing. You're looking to see a trend over a period of time, and the period of time is not years. <laughs> so <laughs> once you identify someone's got an EGFR less than 60, you go straight to this page and you use the pathway. We didn't have to create the pathway. Kidney Australia created the pathway. They said, here it is, general practice move on it and we did and it's been marvelous and I can't encourage you enough to do it it really highlights your day when you're doing something you're not just doing a blood pressure height or weight or whatever you think you know the patient and suddenly oh whoa the EGFR's dropped off it's 42 yet it was 75 last time what's going on you look down their med list and you say oh well, there's a 
there's, a, there's an ARB on there, there's an ACE. What's, the, what's, what's going on here? Spirolactone's been started, huh? That's not potassium, that's not potassium. What's going on here? Doc, do you, uh, so it was good because it made us all start to be more proficient about looking at the kidneys. So kidneys are a vital sign in our practice. So the take home message I guess for today is an EGFR less than 60, we want to know if that's important and we're going to investigate that until we define if it is important and if it is a problem we're going to then take the pathway a step further, we're going to use the action plans that are, fo that are on the, um, the uh, chronic kidney disease booklet. We're going out actively now looking for people, whereas before last year we were just getting everybody that already had the stuff done. We weren't actively looking for them, but now we're actively looking this year. We're actually going out actively looking and going through our data. We want to know if the smokers have had an ACR and an EGFR done. I don't care whatever else they've got going on. If they're a smoker, they're a target population. The diabetics, of course, we don't miss them because, you know, we've had a program in the practice for three years and our diabetics are pretty booked along family history of kidney disease, we don't ask it. If we do ask it, often it's in the wrong spot. If you've got best practices over in family history, it's not on their current active problem list, it may get missed. Oh, a few of those out there. Stroke and heart, oh, a few of those out there. So that's your population, your target population. The smoker, the diabetic, family history of kidney disease, obesity, stroke, heart disease, and indigenous. That's a lot of people in your practice, hey? It's everybody, virtually. Ah, you thought we would have missed it. Hypertensive. So all those people should be having an ACR and an EGFR evaluated. And that evaluation process requires you to look at that to see what you're going to classify that patient as. You could get excited and look at all the symptoms, but look at all the symptoms. Everybody has all those symptoms. But you really should pay attention to a patient that's telling you some of those symptoms and we can't really work out what else is wrong with them. And the reason we want to say that is because kidney disease doesn't announce itself. It's a very quiet situation with the kidneys. They go on and on and on until they're almost not working. We wanted to connect also in the practice blood pressure to the kidney. We wanted to make sure the patient was on board with us. So when we do a blood pressure in our practice, we don't say, oh, that's all right, or, you know, is that all right, blah, blah, blah. We say, oh, your kidneys are happy. Look at that pressure. They're not under pressure. Beautiful. And they go, oh, blood pressure's got something to do with my kidneys. So raising awareness with our patients. So in general, we want their blood sugars in their target range for their age, phase, and stage of their journey with diabetes. So it's not just the classic HbA1c less than 7% or 4 to 6 or 4 to 8 or wherever your little jig is. There's actually the RACGP guidelines for um, that. So you should be sort of evaluating that diabetic patient according to that not sticking to your rigid HbA1c of 7%. Um, we want to know their blood pressure is not hurting their kidneys. And if they are, for how long has it been going on? <laughs> and what can we do about it? We want to make sure that they're getting the correct blood draws timely and we're monitoring their filtration rate and protein. So our aims pretty much worked out. We, we were able to do a lot of this stuff. We were able to confidently say we can work out 3s and 3Bs and 3As and 4s and 5s. And we put that on the active problem list. If it's a one or a two, we didn't put it on there. There was no point to put that on there. People could if they wanted to. That's up to everybody. But we chose not to classify one and two, but to spend time putting active problem for 3A, 3B, and 4 and 5. So if you go and download the booklet and pop it on your desktop and you open up page 17 as part of your normal rigmarole, you'll be on this page all the time. So you'll quickly, within about a week, get to know where you're at. Questions? Do I go too fast? I'm always very time conscious. Any questions? No questions. I would, reckon that I would say that there was uh, a million questions about uh, uh, chronic uh, kidney disease. Um, and uh, because we uh, are short on time, I'm sure that you will find Diana and ask her because I know that we did something years ago as simple as uh, uh, encourage the registrar, new registrar to do a project. So we asked the lab for the EGFRs and, um, and it was amazing. And yes, we did find two people that did have now, are now on dialysis. And, and so, yeah, it's an important part. Oh, what happened there? Oh, <laughs> thank you.